Anne-Marie, thank you very much for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm very well. Very well, thanks. Thank you for having me. So first of all, let's just dive straight into it, shall we? Uh, like many of us, it, it seems to be a pattern. You came from the left over to where you are now. In fact, correct me if I'm wrong, you were trying to stand for a Labour representative in Parliament, right? Yes, yeah. Now, that, that's quite a journey, considering you're now labelled the far-right leader of a nationalist <laughs> party. So I'm just curious, was it a particular policy that broke the camel's back for you? Or was it a, a series of events that told you that the Labour Party and the left as a whole, I suppose, wasn't up for the job? Yeah, I think there were a few things. There are a couple of specific points. First one that springs to mind is the FGM conversation I had around a committee table in Streatham. And these are probably in the earlier days of my activism in Labour. was an admission by them that if they stirred up trouble on FGM, they would lose a lot of the Somali vote locally. Um, and that was always the that was always the priority was, you know, no matter how disgusting the issue, you know, no matter how disgusting the crime being committed, the issue was always winning and the priority was always winning and not losing votes here or there or giving any kind of credence to their political opponents. And that was always the priority. And, you know, you can sort of accept that in politics to a degree, but surely when you get to the point where you're mutilating children, principle has to come first and you've got to decide what kind of person you are, which is do you stop the mutilation of children or do you let it happen? And on a blind eye. I changed and I became a little bit tougher. I became a little bit more, uh, I recognise more the value of the nation state now. Uh, and that part of me, I guess I have gone a little bit towards the right in that regard. But many other aspects I haven't changed at all. I still want to protect children. I want to protect our freedom of speech. I want to protect women's right to walk down the street and not be attacked or uh, harassed. I realised that Labour was actually the problem. It was causing all this, uh, all this misery that we were seeing. Uh, and uh, the final straw actually came in Brighton when I realised that it was endemic in the party. They were absolutely unconcerned about issues if those issues were politically inconvenient to them. What happened in Brighton is I stood to be selected. I stood in the selection to stand against Caroline Lucas. Towards the end of it, I did the notorious, the infamous Oxford speech of uh, Islam is not a religion of peace. And that was it. That was it. I mean, literally people would turn to their back. The day of the hustings, people who had supported me physically turned their backs on me. They were so disgusted. Um, there was, I was something on the bottom of their shoe now because I'd said uh, that Islam wasn't a religion of peace. I just, it, 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 was, it was shocking. And I realized how far gone and there was just no, because, you you know, you're young and idealistic as well when I started out. And you think they don't really understand. If they knew, they, would, they wouldn't tolerate it. Um, but then you realize they really do know and they just don't care. Um, so it's a catalogue of things that I realised that I had to get out of there. Um, it was causing so much, so much harm to this country. It completely abandoned working class people. It really is that that sort of stereotype of, of latte drinking Islington types. What you say there about the especially abandoning the working class is what I relate to the absolute most. Just from the part of the country that I'm from, everyone up here votes Labour no matter what, yet you can't say that the modern Labour Party or the Labour Party in general for a long time has ever represented the working class um, in, in a meaningful way. It, it, I mean, obviously, we know the answer to this, but let's just say it out loud. Has the Labour Party abandoned the working class to go for the Muslim vote and the ethnic minority vote? Are they prioritising? It's importing a new working class and, and, and importing a new wave of, of dependency. You know, Labour needs people to rely on social welfare, for example, uh, and it's importing a whole new wave of this. Uh, of course, it's assuming that it's going to keep these immigrant votes. I don't think it is going to keep them, certainly not forever. Uh, and if it's going for the Muslim vote, it's not going to keep that forever either. There will be probably Islamic parties and, and you know, the, the, the social conservatism will, will hit with the social liberalism in the Labour Party. The, the transgender aspect will start to clash with Islam. Um, <laughs> yes. So, you know, it, it, it's a recipe for disaster, really. They're trying to please complete opposites at once. The idea that it stands for the British working class is completely must be understood by people more and more now. And or, I hope I'm not being too optimistic to think that. But I do think a shift is going to come in the Labour heartlands. It's definitely not going to be easy and it will take some time because it's quite ingrained in people the, in the Labour heartlands. Uh, but what else is there to do? but to push back against Labour. It is an anti-British party. Uh, if you look at the front bench of Labour, Jeremy Corbyn, Diane Abbott, these people have a history of anti-British sentiment uh, and, of sort of, and of allying themselves with open uh, haters of this country. That can't last. Surely people must see now. It's a 
terrible situation for us, the, the British public. Because on one hand, like you say, you've got this dangerous party in Labour, led by Marxists and, and Diane. I mean, Diane Abbott as Home Secretary gives me nightmares, to be perfectly honest with you. But then you look across the aisle, and it doesn't get much better there either. Instead of Diane Abbott, you've got Sajid Javid. Instead of Jeremy Corbyn, you've got Theresa May and the rest of them. The Tory party, are, and, and this, I, I saw you give a speech and, and you said that this notion that people have to vote for the Tories in order to keep Labour out is just, it's like hanging yourself really because the Tories are no better. Now they go about things in a slightly different way, but they're still cancerous to, to, to the governing of this country, especially when it comes to immigration and especially when it comes to third world outside of Europe immigration. Can you just talk a little bit about that and how we can break through this Tory versus Labour nonsense that this country is consumed with? It's extremely, extremely difficult, and, and particularly because we had a referendum on changing the um, election system to Parliament not that long ago. Uh, so the chances of us getting another one were very slim. So I don't think we can rely on proportional representation to make change or changing away from proportional representation. I think we have to accept that that's what we have. But look, you're absolutely right. The Tories are no different to Labour when it comes to the big issues, the fundamental issues. And the biggest issue facing the country is mass immigration. And the Tories are no better. The only difference is that the Tories have a different reason for wanting mass immigration. They want it for cheap labour. They want it to keep big business happy, whereas labour wants it to, to import a new working class. Uh, so they both want it, but for different reasons. And um, they're both, you know, we talk about taking back control of immigration when we leave the EU, but, you know, three quarters of immigration I read recently comes from outside the European Union. Yeah. So, uh, we, you know, we've been letting them get away with this all this, all this time and believing that it was all about getting back control from the European Union. Well, of course, that's important, uh, but they've had control of non-EU immigration all this time. Uh, and that's actually the immigration that's causing the greatest social issues, uh, the largest welfare dependency is coming from outside the EU. So we've sort of been letting uh, the, the political, and including UKIP in this actually, distract from all this by putting all the focus on the European Union. And now all sorts is going on uh, while all the focus is on the European Union, such as, such as the uh, UN Global Compact on Migration just nice and easily. Uh, but also the Conservative Party policy on immigration was released quite quietly during the, the Brexit focus. Uh, and it will it's, it's going to increase immigration, if anything. It's taking the cap, for example, of skilled workers and, and redefining what a skilled worker is. It's actually going to bring more people in. Uh, and people are, this is all just going, passing quietly while all the focus is on the European Union. Lots of Brexiteers have also used this line of, of, of argument saying, oh, well, if we get out of the EU, that means we can take immigrants from all over the world. It's a less racist immigration system. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know what? The, the neighbourhood that I live in and, and the region of the Northeast, the main reason people vote for Brexit is because of immigration, if I had to boil it down. But they don't have a problem with the French guy who comes over to study at Sunderland University or whatever. What they don't like is, quite frankly, the third world migrants coming over with all these backwards dare I say it, barbaric belief systems. That, that's what they voted against. Now, they knew that, you know, leaving the European Union wasn't going to stop these people coming, but it was a statement and they're not being listened to. And when I hear Brexiteers, mainstream Brexiteers come out and say, well, we can take people from Pakistan and uh, Iran and wherever else, I just slap my forehead and think, oh my God, are, are you are you daft? And as I say, the biggest social problems as well are actually coming from countries outside the EU. You know, immigration from France or Spain is not going to bring enormous social problems to the UK, but immigration from Somalia is and does. Uh, you know, it's bringing with it uh, horrible crimes, uh, cultural practices, encroachments upon our rights, and that's, that part is fundamental. We have a right to free speech in this country, for example. We have a right to say whatever we like about any religion we like, uh, and yet we are bringing in this migration which just doesn't see it that way and which won't see it that way and so we're being asked to to reduce our own rights to accommodate the requirements of a completely different culture we're not all alike uh, we have the world is filled with different worldviews and different cultures and different belief systems and we have this left-wing insistence this do lally fantasy that we're all actually lovely underneath uh, we're all the same we all want the same things we don't we're importing uh, cultures which will never be compatible with ours and the inevitable social legal problems the police can't deal with this stuff how can you deal with this it's too big it's too much of it so we're having a fractured 
uh, segregated society along cultural grounds. And the left celebrates this as multiculturalism. I think it's a disaster. Yeah, exactly. I'm so glad you made that point. Um, th this thing you just said about how the left views, well, they like to view everyone as, oh, we're all nice, we're all human beings, there's only one race, the human race, and we're, we're, all, like, we're all this, we're all that. This naivety, it manifests itself in very destructive ways. I'm sure you saw the stories recently about young European women going on hiking trips throughout certain countries, Morocco, and getting viciously murdered and all sorts. They've been fed this information from the top down, and it's making young people think, oh, you know, it's just propaganda when they say that Islam's not a religion of peace and all this stuff, and I'll be fine if I walk through this <laughs> this rural third world neighborhood by myself as a woman wearing, you know, shorts and all the luxuries that I can afford to wear in the West. And yeah, it's importing all of these cultures is just going to lead to conflict on the streets of Britain. And do you feel this frustration like I do? Definitely. It's, it's a virtue signal. Yes. That's exactly what it is. We should have been talking about immigration from outside Europe all along because that's the, where the real problem is. And like, you know, people, you're right. It's, it's in every, the, all the working class areas, all the towns and cities of this country. They're not overly concerned about a French guy coming to, it's not who we're talking about. We're talking about the transformation of communities, unrecognizable languages we can't understand spoken everywhere and written everywhere. You know, people wearing clothes that are alien to us. Uh, suddenly our high streets are not English shops anymore, uh, but for you know shops from from other parts of the world, and if people become strangers in their own towns and communities and it, it no longer feels like home anymore and you know those feelings are never taken into account we always talk about people's feelings and how important they are but what about the feelings of the ordinary english people who've seen their towns and cities transform beyond recognition uh, there's no, you know there's no consideration for feelings there but you you know we, it's always been about white immigration and it's because it's white because they've been afraid to talk about non-white immigration exactly uh, because it opens them up to being called racist they should have bitten that bullet and when people play that game when they they back down, uh, you know, the I'm not racist, I'm not racist. Uh, you're, just, you're just strengthening that. You know, you're just giving credence to it. We should have had guts from the beginning and stood up and said, look, we're talking actually fundamentally about non-European immigration because that's where the fundamental problems and the country-changing problems are coming from. Uh, but it, it's, it's not easy because I've done it uh, and you see what they've done to me and other people watch that uh, and don't want the same. So it works, it works. We're allowing bullying to work. Uh, and one of the sad realities of life, actually, is that bullying does work. This is a great example. Yes, and speaking of speaking of that, one of the things that I find most impressive about you and For Britain is, as far as I can tell, you are the only political party out there that is identifying and talking about this anti-white narrative that has taken hold, not just in Britain, but across the Western world, as far as I can see. This, I guess, I'm going to use the word hatred here. Because it is. This okay. hatred of white people, specifically yes. white men, I have to say. Mm. Why does this exist? Why is it getting worse? And how do we punch through and make this a mainstream issue? Because you are literally the only person who can get on television who's talking about this. And it, it, we've been talking about this on YouTube for years, but of course, YouTube is three, four years ahead of the mainstream discussion. So how do we do this? Well, to start with why it's happening, it's happening to weaken white people. Uh, if you want a globalist world and the people in, you know, it's, and it's not a great conspiracy either. Let's just get that out of the way. I'm not talking about a global grand conspiracy for a new world order. I'm talking about politics and ideology. That's what this is. Politics is the battle of ideologies. And there is a very, very powerful ideology called globalism. We t refer to as globalism. It wants a connected world, a borderless world. Uh, it's manifest in various different ways, like the United Nations, which is completely anti-nation, ironically. Uh, the European Union, it's all going in that open border direction. Uh, and of course, it, it uh, very much suits the very, very wealthy. So we have, if you want a globalist world and you want cheap labor, you want to cheapen labor in the most free and most successful, economically successful region in the world, you're going to have to, to cheapen the labor, you're going to have to bring mass migration into it. If you're going to expect a continent of people 
to give up their countries, to allow themselves to be subdued and bullied in this way, as to not only bring half the world to our, our countries, but then give them advantage over us, such as in job applications. You know, whites excluded from job applications. Even, and this one really blew my mind, English Heritage, uh, a, the organization Eng English Heritage, yes. was advertising for people and excluding white people. This is crazy. How can you exclude white people from English Heritage? <laughs> You know, it's, it, this is how bad it is. Um, it's, this, it's, it's everywhere, this anti-white sentiment, because I believe it's part of, of, of globalism. That if you have to bring mass, mass migration into Europe so that you can cheapen the labor market and essentially create this, this slave, uh, this wage slave uh, Europe, uh, you have to de dampen the spirit of white people. You have to tell us that we don't deserve countries of our own. We don't deserve a homeland with which Europe is the homeland of white people. And that doesn't mean we hate anyone else. It doesn't mean people can't come here and share in it in reasonable numbers. Uh, but but it's still ours. You know, it's, there's no. I, I I feel part of this continent. It's right. And I'll tell you something. I the, years ago I never felt white. Now I do feel white, and I'm very aware of my whiteness, and I'm very aware of the assault on my skin color. And people are becoming more and more aware of it. And I want reasonable voices like mine because I don't there's no hatred here actually what I'm doing is opposing hatred hatred of my own skin color by calling it out this is wrong excluding people from job applications because of their skin color is wrong and the, the rhetoric we hear all the time is too many white people too many white children in the school I mean that's disgusting what message are you sending to children and what they're taught at school is that white people are responsible for this and that and and so ironically talk about a, a expression of white supremacy that's white supremacy we tell the world that white people are ultimately responsible for everything that's wrong uh, and deserve to be punished for it and this is hammered into white people so that we will give up our countries without much of a fuss i think personally in the next couple of years in mainstream discussion demographics as a topic is going to be very widely discussed just because in a couple of years time the next census is going to be released and the shocks of the 2011 census for example the one that really got me white Brits were a minority in London. I can't remember the exact number, 40 something percent. The trends aren't going to reverse in, in those 10 years, are they? So that when the next census comes out in 2021, we're probably going to see that number even less than it is now. And when people think, wow, God, white Brits are a minority in our own capital city. That's a bit, that's a bit off, isn't it? I mean, there's something in people's minds kind of, they, they don't like it. It's just a natural reaction. And what you were saying about homelands, exactly. There's nowhere else for us to go. There really isn't. And for people who think that this isn't a big deal, all I would say is, and I always use this, this example, imagine if you travelled to Tokyo on holiday and you saw millions of Scandinavians walking around. I mean, would you be like, oh, God, this is really Japanese, this place. Do you think Japanese culture is going to improve or decline? It's a simple answer, isn't it? So, um, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Getting demographics into the public sphere is essential for us to make way on this. And not even UKIP are really talking about this as far as, as, far as I've heard. No, I, not that I've heard. Um, but you're right, it's going to be a major issue. Um, either we talk about it or it's going to be fought on the streets. Um, and I'd rather we talked about it because there's a lot of frustration when people are ignored and when real, you know, real life profound changes are taking place for people across this country and they're not allowed to talk about it uh, and and unless we change politics they're not going to be allowed to talk about it so if they're not allowed to talk about it then tensions rise and you're going to see violence in the streets unfortunately we've got to discuss this and we've got to do you're absolutely right we don't have anywhere else to go what happens and with the anti-white rhetoric that people are learning in school and what are we going to do about attacks on white people are we just going to is it just are we going to get to a state of where it's real oppression of white people we might just um trouble is ahead we're going to have to find a way to settle this peacefully and to learn to live side by side but in acknowledgement um of the british majority and the will of the british majority will be will determine our culture and people have got to accept that or we've got to start asking people to leave if they don't accept it but it's time to step up it really is time to step up we've a decade or so to start really pushing back uh or else we're, I think we're in trouble in the longer term. I really do. I can't see that the anti-white hatred is going to go away on its own. I don't think people who are empowered by it are going to give it up. So it's up to the majority to start speaking up 
fighting back now uh, while we still can do so democratically and peacefully because I don't want this to spill into the street. And if it continues as it is, it will. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's it's one of the it's the most important topic for the future, in my opinion, and my audience is certainly on board with that. Uh, let's talk about for Britain as a party um, for a bit, because the things you're saying right now, I mean, the, no one in the mainstream would ever say this, even though I find them and many people find these views very moderate and just common sense politics. Really, um, what were the biggest challenges that you faced trying to set up a new political party that? that people perceived as being very, very far right. We all know that's nonsense. Um, was there any pushback from the, the, the powers that be uh, when you were trying to set this up? Well, it wasn't easy. I mean, even getting through the Electoral Commission had its moments. Um, but the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge, the biggest obstacle to me is the media. Um, the media are really, really, I, it, it's hard to come up with a word to describe it. You have to have been on the end of the mainstream media to really understand what they will do, how dishonest they are, how much they, how much contempt they hold for people like me, the journalists themselves. They absolutely, they think we are something on the, but you know, they, the way they talk to you, the way they look at you, they really do. Um, they, they, we clearly discuss them. The bias is unbelievable. And they will write things as if I've said them. So for example, Anne-Marie Waters says she's going to set up a new far right party. I didn't say I was setting up a far right party. I explicitly said I'm not setting up a far right party, but they they print it that way. Or they'll, uh, I think one of them said, uh, Amory Waters says she's going to take advantage of the the gap in the market left behind by the BNP. I said nothing <laughs> of the kind, but they make it sound like I've said it. And they, they skate just within the law. Um, it's it's so profoundly immoral what the media will do to you. They they create a caricature out of you. You know, thanks to the media, people out there think I will meet people in the street who genuinely think I'm a Nazi, an actual Nazi. Uh, people who think I'm, uh, I've proposed eugenics. I, I want to sterilize Muslim women is some ridiculous fantasy thing I'm supposed to have said. But they allow this, they knowingly allow these things to be said about you. Uh, they knowingly twist what you say. They'll take one sentence and, and make it look like you have nothing to say. Um, it's, 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 it's unbelievable what they'll do. And one of the things I love so much about Donald Trump is that he takes them to task on this. He, is, he sees it, he gets it, just how devious they are and just the damage they are willing to cause for their own politics because they're not, of course, objective observers of politics. They are political activists uh, <laughs> maintaining the status quo. They are acting, they may as well be an arm of the state because they will demonize anyone with views inconvenient to the state. And it's all that every time you get into the mainstream media, which I don't get very much, but every time it's the same situation. I had it recently on the big questions as well. You, just, you know, it's you just the room is full of the tension you can cut with a knife. And the, as soon as I walked in, I could hear see the sort of elbowing, and and the the audience is filled with people from stand up to racism and all. It's it's essentially a setup. You know, they they want to destroy you. They it, it's it's incredible to describe. It's a hatred that the media has for anyone who won't go along with their with their rhetoric and with their political agenda. It's quite it's a poison. It really is, and it's definitely the biggest challenge. If we could get around that, if we could, if more people were watching the internet, I mean, I know it's hugely, huge numbers do watch the internet, but huge numbers sadly stu still do um, take their, their uh, information from the mainstream media. That we really have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, and I, th I think Tommy Robinson's uh, thing coming up could be very interesting to see uh, what evidence he's got to show just what they will do and just how, how despicably dishonest they are. That's the biggest obstacle, definitely. I was going to ask you about the big questions because that that TV, for those who don't know who may be watching, the big questions is a show on on the BBC on a Sunday morning, and it is the most infuriating thing to sit through, especially if you have the political persuasions that that we have. It's almost as bad. Actually, no, it's worse than Question Time. Actually, it's where because at yeah. least at Question Time, there's sometimes people in the audience who will call out the politicians for talking nonsense. The big questions, as you were saying is just full of anti-racism activists. Um, minorities, I noticed when you were on um, last a couple of weeks ago, they, they just surrounded you with <laughs> black people, Muslim people, because they knew, oh, Anne-Marie Waters is going to talk about some controversial issues. Let's fill the room with people who can shout at her. And none of them listened to a damn word that you said. And the thing that really annoyed me, and it happens to everybody on, on our side of things, 
is they treat you as if there's something wrong with you. Like there's a defect in your brain. Like you can't possibly actually believe this stuff, Anne-Marie, <laughs> right? And it, it's almost like your, your concerns and the concerns of the people who support you aren't genuine. Yeah. How do you sit through that environment and not just say, fuck this, I'm leaving, and then flip the bird and, I don't know, toss a grenade <laughs> in behind you? Because that's what I would do. Oh, God, it's not easy. It's not easy, especially when you're not allowed to talk back. And uh, there were several occasions on that last big questions when I put my hand up because things were being said about me. And I put my hand up, and there was no way Nikki Campbell was coming back to me, so I just had to shout. I wasn't going to let it go uh, unresponded to. But it is infuriating, and, and sometimes are easier than others. And, and you know, But it just, it, it's... They brought me on as the far right voice, even though I insisted, because you do this sort of half hour interview on the phone before you go on. And my entire, you know, I insisted to them, we are not a far right party. If you look at our policies, these are not far right. But they brought me on anyway as the far right. And you can see uh, Nikki Campbell afterwards on Twitter telling people how to complain about me coming on. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's, and he didn't shake my hand at the end. This sort of, it's just, it's pathetic, actually. But they are, they're poison. They're absolute poison. It's infuriating, but you do it because you need to, you know, there's going to be people sitting at home who will think, actually, um, you know, that, that, that woman's spot on. I agree with her. And most of, of the responses on social media, I'm talking 90 percent, if not more, were in agreement with me. Um, so, you know, the, the mainstream media tries to, to, to embarrass people like me. Or, you know, they bring us on so they can destroy us. So it doesn't work because they're just completely out of touch with public opinion, much like politicians are. Uh, and when they're trying to destroy us, they're actually uh, letting us tell people uh, who get get speak to people who will agree with us there are millions at home who think exactly like i do so you put up with it in order to speak to those few who um who agree with you and think that they're on their own and they're not and we need to tell them they're not you're right the, the way to get around this is to support independent media especially yeah. on the internet and um you're on my channel right now thank you very much i've got quite a big audience i only started a couple of years ago but there's many other people on youtube especially who who side with you and what you believe in and if you do the rounds and really get your voice out there then i think that is the, the a great first step into garnering support so what's your what's your opinion on independent media not only on youtube but in general on the internet do you think it's uh, well needed and how do we how do we push it further Oh, we definitely need it. You know, we there are things, really important things, that I don't think we'd even know about if not for the alternative media. For example, Cologne. I don't think we would have been told about Cologne if it hadn't been broken. Was it quite bad that broke that? It's a few days after someone in the alternative media broke. And I don't think we would have been told about it otherwise. And there are things that we only read in, in things like the Gatestone Institute, for example, that you wouldn't know were going on if not for organizations like this. It is absolutely, absolutely vital. And I think it will grow. Trust in the mainstream media is at an all-time low. Unfortunately, it's still very powerful, but it is at an all-time low. Uh, and I think as, as technology improves and things get easier, I think it's going to become more and more important. And I think we're already at the stage where you can have a huge impact on the Internet alone. Uh, Donald Trump won, you know, partly won the U.S. presidency on Twitter. I really do believe that. He'd communicated on Twitter. He'd shown who he was and, you know, he'd, he'd shown his personality and all of this coming through Twitter. And it was hugely, hugely influenced um, people's vote for him. So already at the stage where social media and the Internet can have an enormous impact in politics, as technology gets more and more advanced, this will get bigger and bigger. And I'm not talking about decades down. You know, look at how quickly technology advances. So it's going to be more and more important and people are going to get better and better at it um, and it's going to, it's already changing everything but I think we're just going to continue in that in that trajectory where more and more people are online uh, and technology gets easier to use and people are uh, uh, more and more people are making their voices heard it's changing things dramatically already and I think that will continue well here's hoping because it's going to be good for me as well <laughs> on yeah. a personal level um, so to, to, to sort of wrap up or, or wind this down, I've got a few names for you, both of people okay. and of organizations that I just want to get your opinions on. I always find it's fun to do this. Um, okay, well, let's just dive into it. The woman who needs no introduction, Diane Abbott. <laughs> I honestly, I, I, it's it's one of those things, isn't it? People laugh, including me, when I hear the name <laughs> Diana. But when I say it at talks that I give, everybody laughs. Um, shocking, absolutely shocking woman. 
The thought of her, as I said earlier, the thought of her being Home Secretary is the stuff of nightmares. She is openly anti-British, openly anti-white. If if she were, in, if this were a white politician saying half of what she says, or even implies about white people and the British majority, they wouldn't have a chance. Um, in the Labour Party, certainly. But dreadful, 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 dreadful. And when you think of what she will have in her brief if she was to become Home Secretary, we're talking immigration, law and order. Um, but but then again, as you said, look who's on the other side, Sajid Javid. He's every bit as as open border as Diane Abbott. He is a more weak on immigration Home Secretary than Theresa May was. I mean, you know, Theresa May brought in the hostile environment. It's hard to believe now, but actually that was quite a, it was quite a, a tough thing for a Home Secretary on immigration, and he was ours hours in the Home Office when he got rid of it. So it makes no odds which one of them it is. They're as bad as each other. I mean, okay, he may not um, be quite as a, a nasty a character as Diane Abbott, but when it comes to what matters, which is open borders and mass immigration, they're no different. Yeah, as Sajid Javid's just smarter than Diane, so he knows how to yes. conduct himself, whereas she just comes out and blurts it. So there's there's no there's no finesse with Diane Abbott whatsoever. <laughs> at least Sajid Javid's got a bit of a. Yeah, at least he's got a bit of a brain in him, so he knows he can hide it better, I suppose. Um, Miss Anna Subri. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. Um, oh gosh. What, what, do, what can you even say about her at this point, right? What is it to say? She's um. She's a bit of a crybaby, to my mind. Uh, she likes to dish it out, but isn't quite so fond of taking it. I'm astonished. You know, this this big fuss, this big hoo-ha about someone calling her a Nazi. Gosh, she, she should spend five minutes in my <laughs> world and then see. And again, it's all a state of outrage, isn't it? Uh, Pro-Brexit or uh, Remainer MPs, if they get any abuse, it's a shocking thing. Something must be done. And, of course, they'll use it to restrict our right to protest outside Parliament, this, this, you know, and further restrict our free speech, but purely because she's a Remainer. You can call Brexiteers whatever you like. You can call anti-mass migration people whatever you like. And again, it exposed the astonishing media bias and the astonishing bias of Parliament. Uh, and so she's given us, she's pulled back the curtain on that bias, not that we needed much more examples of it. Um, but... Uh, I don't know. I the, the quality of these MPs. You know, I, I'm thinking. I sometimes I think, is there an MP in Parliament that actually would aspire to be like? Is there an MP in Parliament that I, it's, you know, that I look up to and think oh, that's the kind of MP I would want to be? And I honestly can't think of one. There are some that I admire aspects of, but I honestly can't think of one. I, I think it's it's it, we, it needs get get the sweeping brush, sweep out the House of Commons, and replace it. And it can it can be done. It really can. Emmanuel Macron. Now, before you answer, I just want to say that my audience knows I absolutely loathe this man. I think he's the worst politician in Europe, and potentially the most dangerous as well. So, what do you think of Mr. Jupiter, Emmanuel Macron? I think I can pretty much agree with your summary there. I think that was fairly succinct and accurate. He is certainly one of the more dangerous politicians, and even up against Merkel. I don't, where did he come from? Where did he, in all of a sudden, he was all of a sudden golden boy came along. When Marine Le Pen was looking very, very strong, all of a sudden this banker boy came along, uh, this EU uh, compliant banker boy. Um, absolutely toxic, and his, his approval ratings are showing it. I, I hope the French people get a bit wiser next time and put Marine Le Pen in because you're right, I agree with you. He is one of my least, he's one of the worst leaders in the world. And I include uh, Mr. Trudeau in that. Oh, don't even get me started on him. Yes, I, I think uh, I think Macron, in terms of, you're right, I made a video about him and I said, where did this guy come from? Where did he come from? I think there's some shadowy forces at work, absolutely. Um, finally, Tommy Robinson. Yes, uh, Tommy Robinson, wow. I, I don't know how he puts up with what he puts up with. That man takes an incredible amount of abuse. Uh, and one of the hardest things, and I'm on another level from him when it comes to the abuse I take, but one of the hardest things about this is the lies and the lies that are told about you. Uh, and Tommy has that it, probably more than anyone else in the country. He is smeared, slandered, lied about consistently and constantly, and I don't know how he does it. It takes great, great strength. He's a very, very strong person. Uh, his courage in going up to people and, and facing them. Uh, you know, they'll say all sorts of things. He goes and, and, and faces them. Uh, he's calm with them. 
him. Uh, he he's, he's exposes people. I saw the couple of clips of what he's going to expose of Panorama. He is a he's a force of nature. He's incredibly brave. He has changed uh, in many many ways. He has changed the direction of political discussion in this country, and I'm very very glad that we have him. All right. Well, finally, um, I've been feeling a bit pessimistic lately about the future of Britain. So uh, I just want a bit of encouragement, really. And where do you think, wh what do I have to be positive about? What is For Britain got planned for the future and how, uh, what have we got to look forward to? Because I don't want to lie in this black hole forever. I want to believe things can get better. You know, in the midst of all this chaos, always is opportunity and you know when things get bad you have an opportunity to to make them better if you like to bring change brexit it has enormously uh, changed things in that it has pulled back the curtain on a lot of things people can see now that parliament many people in parliament have no regard or respect whatsoever for our vote they can see now that there is an, an out of touch elite i know that's a catchphrase but it works uh, which is completely alien to their lives has no understanding of their lives doesn't care about what they want this could change things. This will bring change. That kind of knowledge in such large numbers, because more than you know, 52% of us voted to leave the EU. So that's a lot of people who can now see the uh, duplicity of our leaders, the lack of, of, of uh, the lack of a willingness to listen to us is now very, very clear to millions and millions of people. And within that, you have an opportunity to make change. Uh, you also, the mass immigration has actually uh, brought a lot of things to light. Uh, and we uh, will allow us new politics to break through. Whoever is brave enough to take this on can break through. Uh, I, you know, I, th I see us, we're in, we're in a really chaotic situation now, but it's all becoming so obvious to everyone. You know, if you look at the things like the trans, the woman who was put in jail for, or in a prison cell for seven hours for misgendering someone, this kind of thing, it's all just spiraling now uh, to complete madness. And in that madness, people become more and more aware. In observing that madness, people become more and more aware. So we have to take that. We have to take people's increasing awareness and run with it and push and push and push and push. Perseverance brings success. You can actually do it. The hardest part is apathy. You've got to make people believe they can do it. But they can. And, you know, if you want people to believe in change, give them examples of change. And look at that. Look how, who would have thought five years ago we would have voted to leave the European Union? Who would have thought... 10 years ago, uh, we would be in this position now where we've actually voted to leave. And this, this the Euro European Union is actually up in the air a little bit. We're really all over Europe. People are entertaining the possibility of leaving the European Union. This is, in this is incredible to think that 10 years ago, we would have been here now. So things do change really rapidly. And I think the working class, uh, things change usually when the working class have nobody. Um, if you look back 100 or so years when Labour came along, Labour came out of nowhere as a group of trade unions got together and formed the Labour Party. And 20, just above 20 years later, they were in government. This really can be done. And Labour was such a success because the working class hadn't got anybody until Labour came along. Now the working class has nobody again. And it's always the working classes who bring change because it's the working classes who are affected most by the policies of the political elite. So they're the ones who force change. I think if we can get this party, and I think we can, to really reach the Labour heartlands and the people who have been abandoned by Labour and make them realise that they're only voting for Labour out of habit. Uh, and that actually, fear of change is very real, I understand that, and, and I think a large number of people don't want to vote differently because they don't, it's change, it's frightening. But really what they need to fear is not changing because we've been on this road now for a few decades, it's just spiralling out of control now. People are becoming more aware. There's an opportunity in that to reach people. And I think we can do it. I really do think we can do it. Anne-Marie Waters, thank you very, very much. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure.